Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the goings on in week 4 of the Ramesh Sonny Balwani Theranos trial. Are you ready? As a reminder, Balwan is in court accused of multiple instances of fraud against doctors, patients and investors in connection with his role as COO of Theranos. He was co-accused with Elizabeth Holmes, whose trial finished in January this year and who was found guilty on four counts of fraud and conspiracy to defraud investors. His trial is being held separately due to claims of abuse that Elizabeth Holmes made against him in her trial. And so to events at court. So, due to a juror attending a wedding, there was no witness testimony earlier in the week. On Tuesday, however, there was a hearing in front of Judge de Villa to discuss Balwani's motion to dismiss. Now, the judge held this behind sealed doors, so we don't know at this stage the exact exchanges that took place between the defence, prosecution and the judge. We do know, however, that the motion was apparently provided under the precedent of the Brady v Maryland case. Now, what Balwani is claiming is that the prosecution withheld key evidence until the eve of the trial, therefore making it impossible for Balwani to review and prepare for the trial in time. In terms of the outcome of this hearing, while there is a definite but remote possibility that the judge has deferred his decision to some later date, the fact that the trial is continuing and that there has been no changes in the court's calendar probably speaks for itself. I suspect this is the last we'll hear of that motion. Now just to wrap up one loose end, do you remember that there was some discussion about a motion to recuse Judge de Villa due to some prejudice he may or may not have had when the lawyers were questioning potential jurors? And there was some debate at that point whether it related to someone who had to stand up every 10 minutes due to a medical condition. Well we heard more of that this week when two motions were filed by a member of the public, one a motion to intervene and two a motion to strike. Now essentially what was going on was that a certain Mavant Matthew Rafat requested that the court provide him with an ALD, that's an assisted listening device, and allow him to notify the court when proceedings were inaudible. He was saying in the motions that Judge de Villa has personal bias or prejudice against him and so should not proceed further in the trial. He should recuse himself or in common vernacular sack himself. He said that some of the proceedings were inaudible because people weren't using their mics either properly or consistently during the trial. Anyway, odd as it may seem, Edward de Villa, that's the judge, found there to be no evidence of bias or prejudice by himself and denied the motion. Well, that is a bit weird to me. Apparently de Villa is his own judge, literally, and jury in making that finding. Selavy. And so to court, Erica Chung. Erica returned to the stand this week and her testimony included the fact that employees had removed data from tests to make the results look better. I did say in the comments from last week that I'd provide a link to the video I did in the Holmes trial that contained the testimony from witnesses that are appearing also in this trial. If I've got this right, you should see that link appearing about now. If not, I'll put the link in the video description anyway. So Erica Chung then spoke on why she became a whistleblower after she left Theranos. When I worked at the company, we did a lot to deceive regulators. People needed to see the truth about what was happening behind closed doors, she said. She also made the point that she often answered to Balwani. Now to me this is key. Prosecutors will need to show Balwani called the shots just as much as Holmes did. In fact, as far as I understand the reporting structure, Erica Chung was actually one or two hierarchy steps removed from being a direct report of either Holmes or Balwani. So therefore it's quite telling then that she's testifying that Balwani was giving her direct instructions. And if you remember, Balwani's counsel made the point in the opening arguments, and this is me paraphrasing, that it was the lab directors and technicians that took the medical decisions. Well, this testimony is somewhat contradictory, isn't it? When she talked about leaving the company, she broke down on the stand. It's clearly bringing back some bad memories and she talked about the harassment she faced and being followed after leaving. Again, I covered some of this in the Holmes trial. Essentially, Erica left her work that she was at after leaving Theranos. Walking across the car park one dark night, she was approached by a stranger who provided her with a pack of documentation including cease and desist orders. 
very tellingly, when talking about this, she was looking directly at Sunny Pawani. Now, although I don't know her exact thoughts at that point, I would imagine I would have a sense of a wrong being righted to some degree if I'd been in the same position. When she did eventually wrap up her testimony, she apparently visibly sighed with relief when dismissed from the witness stand. Clearly, this was a difficult few days of testimony. OK, so back towards the end of last week during opening arguments, Leach for the prosecution mentioned several expected witnesses, most of whom we've already heard from in the Holmes trial. He did, however, mention one name we'd not heard of before, one former Theranos lab director, Mark Pandori, who was then next on the stand. As an aside here, whilst Holm was listed in the court documents as a potential witness, she wasn't actually mentioned by Leach in the opening argument. And so to Mark Pandori. Now Mark was a former lab director who spent some time at Theranos between December 2013 and May 2014. And he was questioned by John Bostick for the government. We heard about his reason for leaving uh, Theranos and that was due to resistance from Balwani and, as he put it, other high ups after running proficiency testing on the Edison blood analyzers. Now he'd suggested to Balwani that the Edison machines needed additional research and development and these Edison machines were the ones that Theranos had developed themselves and they shouldn't be used on patients until consistent blood tests could be worked out and Balwani said that wouldn't happen. He was upset, angry, Pandori said. Did you consider elevating the issue to the CEO Elizabeth Holmes? Yes, but I didn't expect that would result in a different outcome, Pandori said. He considered Bawani and Elizabeth to be unified in all their decision-making processes. They always presented themselves that way in meetings. They seemed to get along really well with each other, he said. Now I had to chuckle to myself on hearing that as with the benefit of hindsight and all we know about their romantic relationship at that time, all I could think of was, you bet they did. Anyway, Balwani had a temper easily sparked during disagreement with others at the company, Pandori said. After joining the company, he very quickly became disillusioned with the technology. I didn't find it groundbreaking, he said. He made the point that his ethics were challenged because product managers and higher-ups put a high level of pressure on the lab to get rapid results back from blood samples collected from potential investors. Now, the potential investors would be put to the front of the line, essentially jumping the queue, and this would misrepresent the efficiency as it did not accurately reflect the turnaround times. Mark went on to testify that the odds of getting an accurate result from a Theranos testing machine was like flipping a coin. Well, that's it for me for this week. I'll catch up on anything significant on Friday in next week's updates. And if you've liked this update and want to catch future videos covering the trial, then please like and subscribe, and by hitting the bell, you won't miss out. Bye for now.